Hi, I'm Dan Young. Welcome to Dan's Millionaire Code, where we'll show you every single week how to improve your life physically, financially, spiritually. And, um, and remember, we don't have any sponsors or advertisers here. If you find this valuable, please share it with a loved one. And if you find it beneficial, um, share it with them. That's how uh, you can pass the word forward. Um, today, I'm proud to have three members of the most influential family in Utah, in my opinion, Gail Miller, Brian Miller, and Karen Miller. Um, I thank you guys for, for joining me today. Again. Thank you. Um, and just to give you a quick background here uh, on these wonderful friends of mine, Gail Miller and her late husband, Larry, started their multi-billion dollar company, uh, group of companies, back with a single Toyota dealership in 1979. Right. Uh, Gail's owner and chairman of the Larry H. Miller Group of Companies, uh, which has grown to include more than 60 car dealerships throughout the West, the famous Utah Jazz NBA team, I love that team, and the Salt Lake uh, City Stars, Salt Lake Bees, Megaplex Theater, Complexes, which I spent a lot of time there <laughs> with my family, and a, a massive variety of automotive, financial, and real estate uh, development companies. Uh, Forbes ranked Gail, I was just reading this, um, as the wealthiest person in Utah, and she's also Brian and Karen's mom as well. Most important. Yes, number one, <laughs> family first. Um, Brian, my friend Brian here, is on the board of directors of the Larry H. Miller Group of Companies, a writer, a teacher, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and a spiritual coach. Karen is on the family board of, of managers, and we're going to learn a lot about Karen today as well. Um, I've had the privilege to be introduced to Brian uh, from a good friend of mine, and it's an amazing privilege to meet you today, Thank both you. of you. And here's just kind of some fun, interesting Dan facts here. I've bought dozens of cars from your auto dealerships, uh, attended countless jazz games, which I love, um, and I've spent hundreds of weekends. I mean, this is the bonding time from for our family in your theaters, <laughs> watching the newest movies <laughs> that are coming out. Right. Um, and truly what your family has built is um, is not just a financial empire, I believe, but also something that really affects the personal lives of people for fun and entertainment and family bonding. Because all the environments that we went in from buying cars to watching movies has been truly a family experience. Well, it's good to hear that. So uh, I thank you. Um, in fact, I would probably say, I was talking to a, f a few of my employees earlier, and I said, you know who's coming to visit? And they're like, oh, wow, you know how much time we spend watching movies? <laughs> so I, I thank you for that. Well, thank you for, for being a patron. So I just have a few questions here. And if there's anything at all that you guys want to talk about, we can totally go into that too. But one is, um, so Gil, tell us about how your family got started on this path to success. Well, it's kind of a long story because it started uh, back in Colorado. We moved from Utah to Colorado in 1970. Mm -hmm. Larry wanted to play softball for a team over there that invited him to come be on their team, but he had to get a job. So he worked for a man who owned a Toyota dealership. Mm. And as that man grew his business, Larry went from the parts manager to the general manager of the Toyota store to operations manager over five stores. Wow. And then one day he came to him and he said, Larry, you know, I have eight sons and five car dealerships, and I really want my boys to take over my business. Will you go back to the Toyota store and be a mentor and teach them the car business? I won't dock your pay. You'll just, you'll, you'll remain where you are, but I need you to teach them about the business. Well, he realized then that that was the end of his career with that company because uh -huh. the boys were going to come in and take it over. And so we came to Utah on a vacation that spring. And Larry had a friend who owned a Toyota store here. Mm -hmm. And he went to lunch with him and he said, when are you going to sell me your store? And the guy said, well, how about today? And wow. what, what was strange about that is he'd asked the question many times before and the man had always said, I'm not selling my store. This is my livelihood, and I'm not giving it up. But that day, he had changed his mind. I don't know what the circumstances were, but he was ready to sell, and Larry was there to buy. And within two weeks, he was in oh, running that store. Wow. So it went really fast, and that's how we got started. And we didn't plan an empire. We planned one store. 
And it just happened that as we did business, doors would open and new opportunities would come along and we took advantage of them. Here we are. That's amazing. <laughs> and I can relate a lot to that. I remember coming to Utah to visit my sister. She was a academic advisor at the University of Utah. And when I came to, to Utah as a, as a teenager, kind of scoped it out a little bit, um, it was interesting. I decided kind of where I wanted to move. And so she adopted me here a little bit. From where? where? From Los Angeles, California. Okay. And that's where I started my little shop on Night South, downtown Salt Lake City. $300 a month rent, a little hole in the wall. <laughs> and similar maybe to what you have, it just yeah. grew. <laughs> it I was very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, what's interesting is the most effective marketing that we've ever done was actually in your movie theaters. That's what people remember us for. Yeah. Yep. Crazy commercials before big screen the movie <laughs> movie came on. Yep. Um, wow, that's incredible. So I have a question for 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 both of you guys, Ryan and Karen. When when you guys were growing up and seeing some of this happen, what was going on in your heads? Like seeing your you you know your parents grow in this thing. How old were you guys at that time? Little, right? Well, I was a year and a half old when they <laughs> bought the first store. Yep. <laughs> and I was about eight years old when my parents bought the first half of the jazz. Mm -hmm. And then I was 14 when they built the arena. Wow. So from a very young age. Wow. And yourself? Um, I, I really don't remember much <laughs> <that> either. <laughs> yeah, Karen's just a few years older than me. So oh. just a little bit ahead of that. So when all this stuff's happening from car dealerships to, to movie theaters to jazz and all this stuff, you're probably at school, right? You're having people go, hey, what, what, you, what are you guys doing? What's your family doing? And probably hitting you up for, can I get jazz tickets? And <laughs> Well, that, yeah, once we bought the jazz, that kind of opened a Pandora's box. Oh, and wow. and we, were, we were cautioned that if we decided to get into the, the public arena, that everybody would watch and we would be, you know, we'd live life in a fishbowl. And were we ready for that? Well, you don't know if you're ready for that until you do it. Wow. And it's difficult. And it's especially difficult for kids who don't understand why they're being asked those questions or how to answer them or what it really means because they're, their dad's just their dad. Yeah. And so I think it was really hard for them. So I have a question about the jazz purchase. Uh, I know... I had so, I have so much fear sometimes when we're expanding and doing startups. We have we have five companies now. We don't have nearly as many projects as you. But there's a thing my wife and I call pillow talk, mm -hmm. and we're both on our pillows looking at the ceiling, and the kids are typically you know sound asleep, and and we talk about some of our fears and our dreams and those things. Good. And I'm curious though <laughs> about some of the conversations you had about some of these projects. Were there any of these? Projects, whether it be jazz or dealerships or anything that were scary for you guys? Oh, yeah, there there were. And we did the same thing. We'd have those conversations. And Larry shared everything with me. And it sounds like you do with your wife, which mm -hmm. I think is really important. Oh, yes. Uh, for me, I, I wasn't so concerned about our ability to do it. I, I was concerned about why. How big do we want to get? Aren't we okay the way we are? Mm -hmm. Larry was much more entrepreneurial than I was and willing to take a risk and I had confidence in him but I didn't um, I didn't know why we needed more mm -hmm. until one day I said well why do you want one more dealership don't we have mm -hmm. enough he said because I can create a whole lot of jobs for people and I, and that made sense to me then I realized okay there is purpose in this not just amassing an empire it's having a plan and being able to do some good things and Mm -hmm. create opportunity for other people. Well, wow, that's that's weird because that's the same conversation. My wife said, you got nine stores or this internet thing and you want to do two other new companies and you want to do a finance company and you want to do it. Like, why? <laughs> and, and really it was to be able to create jobs and help people have an opportunity. Yeah. Well, what, what's hard, I think, for a man when a woman asks that question is she's saying, why are you spending all your time doing that when I need you here? Yes. We've got this family we're raising and I'm doing it alone and you're out there building this empire. You know, how long is this going to last and why are you making it so big? That's a threat to me. I'm speaking for myself, mm -hmm. of course, but I don't know how your wife feels. 
she felt the same way because we came to this epitome, or I don't know what you call it, I don't know what you call it, like a point where she's like, Dan, like, we don't need more money. We couldn't spend all this. You have to start prioritizing. And I, I think it was the point where she, she was considering just taking off because I wasn't. And at that point, she kind of set some ultimatums for me. Uh, and actually, I was okay with that because I did lose a little bit of touch. And so she made me kind of, um, well, she helped me make the choice to, to schedule high quality time with my, my team and all my guys and girls that work for me in the business, but made sure I scheduled time with Jake and I and my kids and his dog and her and everybody. Well, the problem you know? is your employees are going to be here. I mean, they may come and go, yeah. but the influence you have on your kids is such a small portion of their life. Yes. And once that's gone, you can't get that back. That's true. So you have to spend the time with them while they're there. And that's one of the, one of the things Brian does. He's home for dinner every night at 6 o'clock with mm. his kids. And he has six kids. Wow. And so, you know, I admire that. And Karen's got her family and her animals and, and their, their priority. And I think part of that's because we didn't have that. Yeah. So, so Karen and Brian, so you saw this go down and this kid's in... It was kind of interesting because my daughter is the one who said, you know, mom is right. And and I, it was weird. I was almost deaf to listening to what my wife was telling me. Sometimes I'm like, build, build, build. And then my daughter pulled me aside and had a real big conversation. And then that actually kind of pushed it over the edge where I kind of restructured things a little. Well, good for you, because I know in your mind, you were probably saying, well, I'm doing all this for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have ESP. You too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So from, I would like to hear from your guys' perspective a little bit. Did you feel this going on when you were little? And, and did this influence how you're raising your families now? Yeah, I think it did. Um, I, I just remember him not being around much. He was at work all the time. And I think that did affect the influence and time that I wanted to spend with my family. Mm, yes. I remember when she was six years old and he came home early for dinner and she said, what are you doing here? <laughs> That's so crazy. My so daughter strange. said the same thing. <laughs> oh. Good thing I caught it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so Brian, how about you, man? Yeah, no question. <clears throat> you know, Tony Robbins says every life is either an example or a warning. And I think in reality, every life is both or has some of both in it. And, and so I've definitely learned a lot of things from my dad that, I aspire to emulate, you know, to be a certain way, to have integrity, to, you know, contribute to others, that kind of thing. And there's a lot of things that I absolutely don't want to repeat, you know, like he died due to complications from diabetes, mm. his legs amputated below the knees, you know, at age 64, which in my mind is just way too young. Mm -hmm. And that's true when it comes to parenting and family time as well. So like my mom said, you know, making the commitment to be home at six, when I'm in town now, I do travel a fair amount, you know, mm -hmm. on average about a week a month. So that's the factor. But I, I do consciously endeavor to r have a relationship with my kids is very different from the one I had with my dad, which I always knew he loved me. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't because he showed up at my little league games and my science fairs, you know, and helped me with my homework. That was not the case. Mm -mm. Yeah. Interesting. So, so now... So you have your families individually and you have your mom and you have your other brothers, right? Yeah. Do you guys have a, um, a schedule of family get togethers? Cause I know with so much busyness with business and family and stuff, do you have a, a curriculum to try to keep in touch? You know, we, we now are large enough that it's difficult to all get together, but for probably 30 years, we've had a monthly get together with wow. the whole family. And we just call it family home evening. It's on the second Sunday of every month. And those that can come, come. Those that can or don't want to, don't. And unfortunately, we sometimes it's very small, but other times it's a big group. And I think it's good to have that continuity. Whether they come or not, they know they're welcome and they know the door is open and, yeah. and that we are a family. I think to me that's really important. Yeah. And in addition to that, mm -hmm. we have a family reunion now. It's kind of crazy to me to think that with... You know, my four siblings, the five of us kids, plus our nephew Zane, who's basically a, a brother, mm -hmm. um, that 
our annual gathering is now large enough to be a reunion, but it is because there's almost 70 of us. Wow. Between Mary and Ed Forge. Yeah. yeah. So we do that every summer at our lodge. And then every um, December we have our Christmas get together. And in addition to that, we have quarterly meetings where we get the entire family together to talk about the whole thing about family, business, philanthropy, you know, and it's, it's a pretty quick evening. It's, you know, a dinner and then basically a presentation. We get an update from everybody. What's going on in your life and, you know, what are you excited about? And it's just a way, again, of being consciously connected. Wow. It's important. If you don't plan it, it doesn't happen. You have to schedule it. Yeah. Make sure that it happens. Wow. And it's kind of interesting. I was um, super excited about interviewing you you guys today. And someone asked me, are the Millers, are they snobby? Are they stuck up? (laughs) And I said, well, my interaction, because uh, uh, I've met uh, Greg a few times, right? And then Steve on some trips before. Like every family member in the Millers has been warm, caring, giving, positive energy, selfless. <laughs> That's uh, great. It's been pretty, it, it's cool because a lot of people think because you have billions of dollars in this and selling this and growing this and have this empire, this, that. You're some sort of different sort of creature, you know, whereas, you know, you guys are probably the most down to earth people. I mean, you wouldn't know just bumping into you, talking to you. You're like, these are just really great humans. Well, thanks for setting the record straight. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, nothing pretentious, very like, like if I didn't know who you were and I just met you, I'd be like, oh, these are some great people from, I don't know, Salt Lake City, you know, or Midvale. And they're just out, you know, having Uh, lunch or something. You know, I think that's the secret to a happy life is you just being one of the people, not thinking you're anything spectacular or different, you know, because we are all all the same. We all do have our trials, our challenges, our joys, our fears, and it doesn't do anybody any good to put themselves on a pedestal. Yeah, that's amazing. I was talking to my wife about you, Gail, last night at dinner, and it made me think a lot. And I said, Tiffany, if something happened to me, would you want to run all these companies? (laughs) And she says, maybe I'll listen to your podcast and see what (laughs) Gail says. Uh, Because I'm just used to, you know, raising the kids and making the home good and solid and making sure no one's going crazy. And I see that qualifies her. That's that's what I did. Um, and the thing that you do that we did is you talk about it. So she knows what you're doing. Yeah. She knows where you are and how you feel about it and what you have. And, and what, that's one thing Larry did. And the other thing he did was he never, ever made boundaries between money. It wasn't his money and my money or company money and our money. It was everything that was his was mine and everything yes. that was mine was his. And so I didn't feel that he was holding anything over me. And when he died, you know, I had the choice. I could have sold everything, and and I was the same age he was. I could have said, "Eh, I don't want to do this. Uh, It's been a good ride. I'll just sell it and ride off into the sunset, do what I want. But we had done something really special together, in my opinion, and it was too good to not continue. And, and create, continue that legacy and let the kids have an opportunity at it. Wow. So that's, you know, I didn't step in to run the company. Greg was doing that. Mm-hmm. But then when Greg stepped down and, well, before Greg stepped down, Brian and I had an opportunity to work together and create a, a mission, vision, values platform because we realized once Larry was gone, the guiding hand of the company was gone. And possibly the values and the the way he ran the company could dissipate. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure that didn't happen. And and Brian did some really, really good work. And we call it who we are. And now it's used throughout the company as the onboarding material. And we train with it. And so everybody knows who we are and what what we were built on. Mm -hmm. And that became my goal as well. That instead of running the company, I wanted to make sure it perpetuated and mm-hmm. that we had a vision of the future so that we would always be uh, based on the values we were built on. 
So and Brian did a really good job with that, and it's still very strong and alive today. It says on the website that you are director of cult culture. That's right. Culture. So yep. what are some things that you put in place to carry on with? Gail was saying to pay yep. passport, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak a personal testimony. Going to the movie theater and speaking to the employees, not just one, but like the person who's making your popcorn <laughs> or going to your Ford dealership. And I picked up a Raptor there, right? All these four by four things. And just the way the employees there were communicating, you could see, obviously they wanted to sell me something, but they cared about me. That's great. And in the theater, simply, would you like extra, would you like a butter? Like the small little things that make the big difference that separates the experience. So yeah. I want to know how you did that because I suffer from that. Like when, as we're expanding, sometimes we go to a store and they're like, what are you guys doing? Sacrificing chickens? Like <laughs> you, you guys, like you got to treat people. And then, oh yeah, boss, we got it. Yeah. Well, you know, I feel like I had a lot of great uh, material to work with because my mom and dad had built the company on some really core values. And in fact, we had literally years of discussion, you mm -hmm. know, in this effort to distill it. My perspective was, look, what is it that we want every employee to know and do and behave according to? If we can get clear for ourselves as a family and as the owners of this enterprise, then we have a chance at communicating it. But if that's going to be the case, it's got to be simple. It's got to be memorable and it's got to be actionable mm -hmm. because if it's not those things, it's not going to work. Well, yeah, that's great. Yeah, right? that and, and so with that, um, in one conversation, it, it was funny because sometimes when people are speaking, you know, they might not recognize the brilliance coming out of their mouth. <laughs> but really, in, in one of those conversations in this year long, years long effort, you said, look, there are core values and they're not complicated. It's integrity, hard work, stewardship and service. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, yeah, it's that. <laughs> so really, we were building. Just Can I borrow some of this too? I... <laughs> You're at liberty to do whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so with that, then we said, okay, so it's one thing to have that. And it's not enough to just put it in a handbook or put it on the wall somewhere. Mm -hmm. We want it to be alive. And how are we going to really make sure that everybody gets it and everybody's living it? And so we had a few different projects that really helped with that. One of them was to do a group-wide employee engagement survey, which was the first time we'd ever undertaken such an effort. We'd, by that time, we'd grown to nearly 11,000 employees. Wow. Right? Over That's a large great. geography. And one of the Which, strengths. Which, by the way, when Larry died, we were about 4,000. Yeah, just under 5,000. So we yeah. doubled in size. Wow. And we've been having turnover, like every organization does. Mm -hmm. And it, this was about f five or six years after Larry had died. My dad had died. And we knew that if we didn't write it down, like you said, it could get dissipated, it could get lost or kind of mutate. Right. Understanding that there is no such thing as a cultural vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. Something will fill that space and it'll be the attitudes, the beliefs and the behaviors of whoever happens to be there at the moment, particularly the leaders and the mm -hmm. managers, yep. which is why it was so important to us to consciously communicate it. And as we, we did this employee engagement survey for the first time throughout all of our organizations, which was very different from the way we'd operated. Uh, because one of our strengths, which every strength can be a weakness, right, is that we give a lot of autonomy to all the different business units and all oh, the wow. different stores. So no one had ever said, hey, we're going to do an employee engagement survey in our little part of the group. So as a family, we said we want to do it group wide. We understand what are people's perceptions, what are people's desires and, and this. And then from that, that's where we did a few things. We wrote the book, Behind the Drive, so collected mm -hmm. first person accounts of interactions with Larry. How did he touch your life? What did you learn from him? You know, what act of service did he perform? Which really solidified a lot of the values that we built on as well. Yeah. yeah. So we, by the time this book is done, you know, it's a hundred stories and we could have easily published another hundred. This is available now, this book? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Larry's biography, his autobiography uh, driven, you know, fortunately he wrote before he died which I learned a lot from, even though I lived a lot of it alongside him. Mm -hmm. And and yet I knew there was a lot left to tell, which is why I wanted to write Behind the Drive to get other people's stories. So Driven and now Behind the Drive, that's yeah. out now. Yep, that's right. Yeah, okay, this is awesome. So we did that. And then as my mom said, we created 
the Who We Are presentation, which is something we do every year with all of our employees. We do it actually in one of the auditoriums at the theater and we, we live stream it. So everybody gets it on the same day. Yeah. Wow. And we do that. And then as, as she said, um, you know, it's now part of our onboarding. It's actually part of our recruiting, our hiring process. Our questions are based on these values, our evaluations and training. So it's really become infused even to the point that it's now showing up in our advertising, even though we didn't mandate that it's wow. now. So what I see is we took material that was always there. Mm -hmm. It just hadn't necessarily been written down and shared. So the way I see it, we basically translated an oral history to a sort of written tradition. And wow. so we could preserve it well into the future. Now. That's yeah. pretty cool. That is awesome. Yeah. So the culture though, it's, it's there. I mean, uh, I, I could be, your, I'm like your test shopper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I go to the different, and by the way, also at jazz games, I'm talking even from the level of the concession people, the people that are cleaning the floors, to, you know, the, uh, what do they call those, ushers or whatever that are ushering you through, the caring, helping people. Yeah. That's pretty universal. So, I, uh, you guys have done awesome. Well, you know, I, I think it goes way back to Larry where this, I, I was talking with a, a gentleman yesterday that um, I've worked with over the years. And he asked me one day, he said, what was it about Larry that was different? And I said, one thing about Larry that he did is he gave the gift of time. Whenever you had a conversation mm. with him, he had time for you. And he would spend time talking about things that, you know, if you had questions, he would teach you. Um, and he didn't rush people. In fact, whenever he started a conversation, he'd say, let me give you a little background. <laughs> yeah. And so he would, he would, you know, just lay it out. And, and I think that... Um, I lost my thought train, but the culture stems from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And our people, oh, it, I, it's going back to loyalty. He developed a loyalty because he was invested in yeah. our employees and the loyalty came back to him. So that's a lot of the culture that he developed. And we've tried to preserve that, that people, our people are our most valuable asset. Mm -hmm. And without them, we aren't anything. We can't do what we do without our people. But we have to provide the tools for them and we have to give them the platform to work on. And then they reciprocate. And so it's a really nice dance that happens. Mm -hmm. And um, we hope that will continue. The one, you know, one thing that validates that, my short experience when I went down to the Megaplex theaters, I saw Larry, this is a long time ago. Was he like pruning some sort of flowers or something? He was messing with the flowers or something <laughs> in the fountain. And I had a short conversation, but I had to get to the movie. So I actually like, I got to the movie. But he took some time there to talk to just, you know, little dude, <laughs> which is cool. And, and it was funny because my wife said, you see how, how he, I mean, like cares to that level. Boy, she's like, Dan, you need to be in with your stores with your guys and your girls more and show that. Oh, he loved it. He used to go down to the theater just to be with the people, not to see a movie. It was, oh, I just want to go down and talk to people, see what they're going to see, how they liked it. You know, and he did that a lot. In fact, you know this, it's Snappy's Burgers. Snappy's Service. There was an older gentleman there years back, and he was a snappy dude, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maury. Maury. And he was telling me the story, the whole story. We sat down, I was eating my burger, about how much Larry cared. Snappy oh. used to have a little shack yeah. downtown, across from the telephone company. I used to go over there when I worked at the telephone company. And the people that owned the building were going to tear it down. And Larry and I went in there often, and he was telling Larry that. And Larry said, well, I'll find a place for you. Wow. So we brought him down to the theaters, and Maury worked another, I don't know, 10 years or so. Yeah. Uh, Every time we go, I tell myself, let's go see that dude over at the Snappies. <laughs> go get a burger, chat. He's yeah. really good to talk to. He was like a, psychi a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> we probably That's thought he was. <laughs> so here, here's a big question, um, and a lot of people have asked me, so I'll be really direct with it. A lot of people ask, so the big restructuring of having, you know, Greg and the kids and stuff and then putting in different executives and moving people around. And, and that was your directive as the boss. Um, 
So on the record, like people are asking, what what was the deal? And, Why do that? Yeah, because they're making up all these stories and stuff. And still to this day, you know, everyone has their gossipy mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. So, so what's your question? <laughs> my question is, uh, so uh, I guess is, why why the restructure and why fix it if it ain't broke <laughs> yeah what, what what was the reasoning the family's reason behind your reason as 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 the chairman and boss of, of why to do the restructure well it, there's a very good reason in my opinion other people may not agree with it and it's been a little bit of a hard sell with our people because we were in entrepreneurship for so long and and just you know larry ran it he was the guy and then when greg came in as the CEO after Larry died, he did it a different way. But while Larry was alive, he was very conscious of maintaining the business long term, even after he was gone. Mm -hmm. So he set up his estate. And by the way, we each own half the company. Mm -hmm. And so he took care of his estate before he died in mm -hmm. that he wanted to set it up so it would last for 80 to 100 years to protect all the jobs and all the people who were working there. Oh, wow. And so that was done, and then he died. And as we're executing um, business, and Greg decides to step down, and I'm thinking, I don't have anybody in the family prepared to go into the position Greg held. Mm -hmm. I need to look to the future and get my family prepared for that. But in the meantime, Larry's done his part, but what he didn't do is... He sees a vision of the company lasting for a long time, but he didn't put in a mechanism for it to happen. Mm. So there was no way for a transition and succession that was a sure thing. Yeah. Now, a board creates that, a right. board of directors, because they are consistently following the family's desires, and they're not, they don't work at the whim of the management. They work at the direction of the family. Mm -hmm. And so as the management comes and goes, and at the time Greg stepped down, we had to put in a non-family member CEO, mm -hmm. which is a little risky because you don't know if they're going to follow the same pattern that your own kids would or your family would. I mean, they will because you give them direction, but there's always that chance that, that yeah. it won't work the way you want it to. Um, I realized that I have to have some way to make it steady, consistent, and prepared for the future. That makes sense. So that was my reasoning behind creating a board of directors. Mm -hmm. That's and smart. I, I have, um, you know, Larry always told me, if you ever need advice, here's the guy to go to. So I called him and I said, would you come and work for me and be my my mentor through this process? Because he, he was a previous employee in a high position and an attorney who had done a lot of our deals, so he knew what I was dealing with, he knew contract negotiation, and, and he just had all of the institutional knowledge that I need. And so he helped me through the process of creating a board of directors, and then we've done a lot of other, other things besides that to get the family ready. We now have a family office and a family a family. Uh, Governments. Charter, charter, yeah. Family governance, family charter. Mm -hmm. And so we've got these two things working together. The family's getting ready to whenever this current CEO retires. We hope we'll have someone ready to, to, to go into that position. We may not have a woman have to go through one more non-family member, but at least I can now see that what Larry wanted to have happen has a mechanism to make it happen. Yes. So that makes that's, a lot of sense. that's really the reason that, you know, I, I can only imagine what kinds of stories are out there. Yeah, crazy stuff. But, but it's uh, good to hear exactly. And it makes total sense. Yeah. And, and the results from all this, uh, so 4,000 employees, 11,000, still growing like crazy, continually, continually to expand. Yeah. And then as far as, so you guys do a lot of advisement of, of where it needs to go and the direction of where you want to see expansion. Right. We give direction to the board and we meet as a family and we talk about issues that we're concerned about, the direction we want to go. We create a strategic plan um, and, and then that gets infused into the company. And so the board works in our direction and then the 
So it's the family, the board, the management, and it all works together. It looks like it's working good because your organization, it seems like it has that cohesion, that culture is sticking. Yeah. You don't have a rogue going crazy doing this or that. Everything seems very smart and balanced. It's been very interesting. <laughs> yeah. So um, here's an, a question that's been in my mind is, what is, what is the most scary thing in, from the very beginning as far as like an investment and expansion? What is the one that you lost sleep on a little bit, a lot? <laughs> You know, I I haven't had any of those experiences yet because we haven't done anything in that realm yet. I don't, you know, things are changing. The car business is changing. Who knows what the future holds? But I do remember when we were building our house, and we didn't build a house until, well, until we were well established in our business. We had always bought a used house, so we never we never built a house until we were really ready and could afford to do it. Mm -hmm. And when we got to that point, Larry said, just do what you want, Bill. This is our dream house. Do what you want. Do it how you want. And that was really scary to me. <laughs> <laughs> because I could vision it in my mind, but I didn't know if once it's done, it's, it's there for everybody to see. And what if I made this really critical mistake? And I don't even know what it would be. But, <laughs> you know, like two colors that don't match or something. <laughs> and so I lost sleep over that. And then finally my builder said, don't worry, we won't let you do that. <laughs> but that was really the most scary thing I think I've ever done because it was a multi million How'd it dollar, turn out? A great, lovely home. Good. You guys like it? It's <laughs> beautiful. It's rocking. <laughs> We've sold it now. We lived there 20 years. Oh, wow. But, you know, I remarried and mm -hmm. you have to move into your, you have to move on into your own space. Mm -hmm. So... So what's what's next for and individually and as you know a family unit for the Miller organization? I'm curious on what's what you guys are passionate about and where some of these the different directions are gonna go, new projects, new things that stand out. I'd like to hear from all of you. Got any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here for the food. <laughs> More uh, car dealerships, more sports teams, more this, more... You know, whatever the future holds, we will try to adapt to. There are going to be some major changes in the future. Intelligent, artificial intelligence is going to be a major factor. Mm. Um, the way business is done, the way cars are driven, the way they're... You know, there are going to be some things we have to be prepared for, but right mm -hmm. now I don't know that we can exactly see what it is. Do you want to add to that, Brian? Well, as a family and as a business, we are committed to continuing to do things that make a difference in the communities where where we're based. Um, so from that standpoint, we'll do that. And part of that is our philanthropy, you know, continuing mm -hmm. to get the next gen family members involved in that, help, help them understand, you know, the philosophy and the history behind it, and then help them develop their capability to be uh, effective leaders and responsible citizens, you know, people who contribute instead of ent entitled jerks, mm -hmm. you know, that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, for for me personally, I'll continue to remain involved with the Larry H. Miller Group as a member of the Board of Directors and in my capacity as Executive Director of Culture. Uh, and then I also do some work inside our family office. Mm -hmm. So that work takes about half my professional time. That's mm -hmm. about half my focus. And then the other half of my focus right now is on growing my own coaching business. Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm growing something that's called the School for Good Living. Mm -hmm. And I'm really committed to elevating the quality of life, leadership, and consciousness on earth. You know, seeing help, helping people live a life that matters. Mm -hmm. You know, find more happiness, meaning, and contribution. I do that a few different ways. I coach one-on-one -on -one with people. I have a group coaching program. It's an online product I'm calling Life's Best Practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've taken... The benefit of you know 40 years learning from my parents and a lot of other incredible teachers i've been fortunate to not have to work for a living to not have to so that's allowed me to be able to travel around and go to a lot of seminars and workshops and meet a lot of incredible thinkers and i brought that back and put it into this framework uh, and now i'm sharing it with people that way i'm training coaches so that they can help lead others through this so they can use the content and the platform 
And then I'm also working with families of wealth and influence to help them navigate the journey that we've been through. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. Because cool. what we didn't know, you know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know, that there are best practices and there are, you know, there are things that, that others have done, you know, and uh, those, those can be learned and they can be applied. Wow, that's cool. That is cool. Karen worked in the company for a long time and then she kind of retired. Why don't you tell him your story? Yeah. I'd love to hear. <laughs> um... I worked with the group for 16 years, mostly in accounting and collections and um, just kind of saw time getting away with with my kids and not spending the time with them that I wanted to. So I quit working and bought a horse ranch and Ooh, fun. just tried to spend the rest of the time that I had with my kids at home with them. And now they're grown and moved out and... I'm back to sitting on the board of ma family managers, um, which I'm excited about. So I'm I'm looking forward to the future that that brings for me. And um, uh, I am going to be having a grand another grandbaby here in a few months. Oh, congratulations! Uh, I'm enjoying being a grandparent. That'll be five. Number five. Wow. So. So how many grandkids, great-grandkids, how, how big is the family now? Well, Larry and I had five children. Mm -hmm. My current husband and I, he had four. Mm -hmm. So that's nine. He has seven grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And together we have 42. So that means wow. I have 37. <laughs> oh, wow. And 18 great-grandchildren with two more on the way. You should go with numbers. You know, all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, they are, luckily they generally come one at a time, so you get to know them. You don't have to. And remember. she buys gifts for all of them. <laughs> you pick each one out, and she remembers their birthdays too. Wow. Yeah. Did you use a spreadsheet, or do you have a I use calendar? Use a system. <laughs> oh, see, that's leverage. But, but I do remember. She gets the job done. In fact, that's... I've got your birthday gift out in the car. Oh, wow. don't see? forget it. Okay. <laughs> wow. All right. Because his birthday's tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hey, maybe we can, uh, I don't know if you got something, we can go grab some sushi or something. Or just, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, a lot of people ask, uh, what what do billionaires do for fun? Because uh, we talk about work. We talk about those things. I'd love to hear about the recreational, each one of you guys probably have the horses and different things, but I'd love to hear about it. I, everyone would love to hear about it. <laughs> well, first of all, don't believe everything you hear. <laughs> we never do interview with Forbes, so they're guessing uh -oh. or assuming. Oh, just make it up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so um, I'm not going to confess to that. <laughs> I would confess to being a millionaire. <laughs> but it's only numbers on paper. I yes. mean, real life isn't counted by dollars. Yes, it's true. So for fun, I have never really learned how to play. However, my new husband is very fun. And he likes to play, and I, I have to get to a point where I can accommodate that <laughs> because he's also very patient. But we have fun. We we go to the opera. We go to Eccles Theater. We do Hale Center Theater. We do traveling. And, and uh, the new Hale Center. Pardon? The new theater. Yeah, the yeah. new Hale Center. Beautiful. Yeah. So we do a lot of that, and uh, we we do family things. And, mm -hmm. So that's cool though. It's good. So now you have time to spread we've been married. Yeah, we've been married six years. We've been to Africa, Peru, China, Iceland, wow. uh, New Zealand, New Zealand, Germany. Germany? I've been to Germany. We <laughs> <laughs> did that cruise. Oh yeah, we did that. We we've done a cruise that went from Budapest to um from Amsterdam to Budapest, all the countries in between. We spent three weeks with Greg on a tour of Europe. Wow. Uh, so we've done a lot of traveling, which is something he loves to do because he couldn't do much while his first wife was alive because she was ill. So. Do you like traveling? I've done a lot of traveling, and I'm happy to go to safe places. Oh. <laughs> that's how I am, too. Yeah. So. I'm, kinda, I'm one of these guys that's kind of happy. I'm happy. Actually, being with you guys right here is greater than a one month vacation around the world it, really because the just the interaction you're a people was, person i love people i'm like a 
What does my wife call me? You're a man pug. <laughs> you know? If you were a dog, you would be a, I have a pug, so you would be a pug. Yeah, yeah. that generally happens. <laughs> so that is pretty cool. So horses? Carrot horses? Yeah, still horses. Like... I've been into horses since I was really young, so I was hoping that it would rub off on my kids. It worked 50%. So. Are they half like the horses? Yeah. What, well, half one of them. them. Half, half of them. Half of your kids <laughs> like the horses. Yeah. <laughs> and so is that your main fun outlet? Um, I like that. I like cars. I like um, motorcycles and ATVs. Oh. I like being outside. So let's talk about cars for a minute. <laughs> a lot of a lot of our our viewers are like millennials and teenagers, and also adults, of course. But a lot of them love cars, and and one thing that the Millers, you know, the Empire has been known for is cars. We own a lot of cars. Cars, cars. <laughs> let's talk about cars, though, because do you do you guys still have the family car? With the four GTs and all those beautiful antiques museums and yeah, we can do. we talk about it? Because I'm a total card nut. I, I buy, I've bought tons of cars from you guys too. A lot of ones of my favorites. But thank you. Let's talk about those cars. <laughs> so what, what are what's going on with the Miller family and cars? Am I okay to talk about? Sure. The, sure. We're uh, currently looking at a somewhere some property to house a museum to put the cars in. So that's a current project we're working on. Wow. I don't think we've got anywhere pinned down yet, but yeah. it'll be somewhere that they'll be on display for the public. So you guys, you guys sold the racetrack. You had a racetrack. We had a racetrack. We didn't actually sell it. We had a lease on the property. Oh. We built the track, put a lot of money into it, but we let it go when, when it became evident that it was... The lease was renewable. The track was not making money. We had worked really hard to make it work. Yeah. And then decided that we, we could better deploy our assets somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I think someone is running the track and yeah. using it differently than we did, but maybe in some of the same ways. So I, I know it's being used, but we're no longer associated with it. So we had our museum out there with these cars in it. That's what I remember walking through it. Yeah, yeah. and we took them because they're too valuable to leave out there under someone else's direction oh yeah so some of them went to a museum in colorado some are being stored here until we can build our museum wow. in a in a location where more people can see them do you guys drive them sometimes some of those the cobras and all that <laughs> you know no they're too expensive <laughs> <laughs> sitting at one spot <laughs> larry drove them all the time and he he'd take the kids out and they'd have road rallies in them Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So these are like works of art, having a road rally yeah. and works of yeah. art. They're beautiful cars. Yeah, you got to sneak the keys and <laughs> take that one for <laughs> Yeah. Hey, we can, we can take it out Friday night. We can cruise State Street. <laughs> <laughs> it is your birthday. That's right. We can do that. Get some sushi and the Cobra, you know. That would be fun. So, Brian, what are you doing for fun lately? Well, I, I'm a homebody myself like i love to be home i love to be in my pajamas um i love i love hanging out with my wife you know mm. we have a walk we like to do in the neighborhood it's 3.2 mile circuit it takes us about an hour mm -hmm. being outside is wonderful um i love to read for the last few years i've read at least 50 books i read a book a week wow That's and i would lot. read them like listening was cheating for me <laughs> yeah actually reading um, the yeah paper so, book <laughs> a lot of reading um i love to learn podcasts, TED Talks, you know, seminars, talking to people. So that's a that's a big thing that I love to do. I love to play games, play games of all kinds, board games, card games, video games. I, I hear you have a pinball machine, like little museum thing going on in your building. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of a shrine, kind of a pinball. We, we actually call it the it's Pinball like Palace. Little, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've collected pinball machines for a lot of years and uh, recently bought a small building it's only about 2,000 square feet but it's big enough for about 30 machines <laughs> so i'm just putting the finishing touches on it and uh looking forward to sharing that with with a few few friends could and, we go there maybe in like uh i don't know instagram live stream some video game yeah. action absolutely that'd be fun. fun that'd be fun and if you get when you guys have the museum the car museum built out maybe we can go show the world how awesome this car 
Fred, you, you guys don't understand how awesome this car collection <laughs> it is. Like, it is it is like on a next level of awesome. Yeah. I won't. Well, like, these are these are classic cars, and they all have race histories, or most of them. Mm-hmm. The Cobras all have race histories, mm-hmm. and it's it's they're so timeless. Oh, you see a Cobra, and you think it could have been built today because they're so classic and so beautiful. Did you guys ever go cruising around in those back in the day? You just kind of... you know actually. <laughs> We drove one home. We drove the first one we bought home from California. Wow. Which was fun. <laughs> that's amazing. Driving artwork home from yeah. California. Wow. That's a good road trip. It, it was fun. <laughs> that's pretty killer. So the big message, at least that I'm, I'm getting from this, is family first. And, and spending that time and having it scheduled. And, and for business owners that are scaling... Whether they have a big empire now or they're building one, make sure that you document what the values are. That you define mm-hmm. and live up to. I think um, even Larry would agree with that because he said toward the end that if he could do things over, he would spend more time with his family because all the other stuff would have gotten done somehow. And he didn't need to stay at work and sign every last letter or turn off every light. Or, you know, he could have spent more time with his family. It was the one big regret he had. That's huge. I think viewers out there, that that's a huge one. You know, and that while you're here, make that decision mm-hmm. to know that the work's got to get done. But that family time is a major priority because yeah. you can't you can't get that back. That is huge. Um, if people want to to find you guys, see what you're up to, where can they find you or at least see what your companies are doing and what you're doing? Maybe we'll go through each one of you, where people can find you. Brian can tell you. <laughs> well, they can learn more about our family business at LHM.com. It stands for Larry H. Miller. LHM.com. Um, they can learn more also at LHMauto.com. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's information there about the Who We Are program that we talked about today, about our company history, about um, you know some of our leadership philanthropy. and our philanthropy. That's right. That's all available there. Um, as for me, uh, people can find me at brianmiller.com, it's B-R-Y-A-N, mm-hmm. also at goodliving.com. So brianmiller.com and goodliving.com. Yep. We'll put the links also there so people can find you, especially with your coaching, I think. The coaching and, and experience that you have and all those things you can you can transfer over. I think it's super valuable. So friends, BrianMiller.com. And we'll probably be doing maybe some more kind of fun, crazy podcasts. Yeah. I'd love to, to do that and reach out. Maybe if we could have you again on the future and share kind of what's happening. I also want to do some um, sharing of a lot of the experiences. We have this thing called the We Love You campaign. And we go around to different businesses to find people in different businesses that are experiencing this we love you experience and then we do something really fun for them you know and we don't always have the we love you campaign going but i could think of three times at different businesses that you have like just the popcorn dude at the theater <laughs> who's making that and putting the extra butter for me because he knows mm-hmm. it like that that is a is a we love you experience so uh, we'll be documenting some of that that's cool. fun I love your enthusiasm. Oh, I just, I just love what you guys have done. In fact, for, for the companies I have, the experience, I, I send a lot of my employees to the movies. I pay for them to go to the movie. They go, go over to the movie and, and look at that. And that's how it needs to be when they come in here from, we call it the five sense experience, the sight, the sound, the smell, the touch, the taste. And, and one thing I got to harp on how wonderful it is, is the, uh, the arena. Mm. You guys have taken a sports arena to the next level as far as food, experience, comfort, just traffic flow. The way you guys digitally scan everybody in and just, I mean, it's it, it feels like a whole different level. And the movie, the Megaplex theaters were like that first theater VIP. And it seems like every time I go in there, you guys add something more. Great. Excellent. Have you been to the Cottonwood Theater? I love that theater now. I love it because it has heated seats and blankets. <laughs> oh, that is. And you can lay down and watch the movie. 
That is one of my favorite theaters. That's yeah. that's that's the theater that my daughter and I go to. I'm not we, sure I understand. Whoa, Siri's talking to me. We <laughs> we go to that theater when we have Daddy Daughter Day. Oh, fun! And we we go to that theater because those cozy chairs you can literally recline, mm -hmm. and they have some of the best quesadillas. Yeah. They're like cheesy, super gooey. <laughs> it, when I'm on my my cheat meal, <laughs> quesadilla. That's and then you have those machines that make any soda drink on the planet yeah. with a wow. push of a button. So how many kids do you have? I have two kids. In fact, after this podcast, we'll go through a little walk through. You can see my my son works here, oh. and and he loves it. Great. My daughter now she just got a new job selling video games, wow. and she's going to the university to learn video game programming. Fun. That's her destiny. So my wife and I are sounds like a natural evolution. <laughs> way supporting that. So I wanted to thank you guys uh, for coming coming on. Well, it's just a super us. pleasure to have you, and it's great to just get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> so, friends, also, um, again, there's no advertising on this podcast. There's no charge. I'm not selling you anything. Um, but if you found any of this useful, please apply the lessons that these masters have taught you today and share it with as many friends as you can. And if you like it, rate it a five star. It'll get rated higher on iTunes or whatnot. And maybe more people can see it. So I wanted to thank you for being here today. And God bless you and have an awesome, awesome week.